All right. Good afternoon again uh, from Lagos, Nigeria. And um, I know uh, quite a number of persons are based outside of, uh, outside of Nigeria. So, uh, yeah, before we actually start this session, I would like for us to use the chat box to actually say welcome, uh, just uh, kind of an introductory, uh, introduce yourself. And of course, we would like to know where uh, you are joining from. So I've seen some persons from, from other countries. Uh, yeah, I have my colleague also uh, confidence with me from Nigeria. And of course, I'm seeing our times no gloomy day. It would be great to know where you are joining it from. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself and let us know where you are joining from. Thank you. Right, uh, while we are doing that, uh, I think we should get this uh, session going. Uh, my name is Joshua Adedeji, and like I said, I'm based in Lagos. I'm the program manager for Andy West Africa, uh, which actually uh, managing both the Anglophone and the Francophone uh, West Africa. And of course, with me, I have the facilitator, and like I said, I have my other colleague also on this call. So uh, to start this session, and before I introduce the session, I would also like to get to hear from uh, some of us, maybe three out of five, uh, in a few seconds to just learn from you how you are feeling today and uh, what your expectations for this session uh, is. I just make it really brief. And this is the instruction. I will call one person and then the person, when you're done, look through each other, the next person or random. You could just check anyone. It could be your friend or any other person, just call the name, and the next person will pick it up to just say something. We'll make it quick, just five persons will do this, and we'll start. Particularly, I know people in Nigeria, uh, a lot of things happened recently about the uh, the protest, so we want to know how you are feeling. Uh, we don't want anyone to be uh, demoralized at this time. Yeah, so I will start with someone from Nigeria, and you could actually uh, pick another person as the next person to actually share. So, uh, if you could, uh, Fatai Olaemi, I would like to hear from you in a few seconds. How are you feeling today? Hello, everyone. Yeah, Fatai Olaemi here, Faith Foundation, Nigeria, Lagos. Uh, I, I, feel, I, I feel positive. Um, I, I always feel encouraged, no matter the circumstance. Um, I, I know a lot of, like likely said, a lot of protests in Lagos. Um, around Nigeria, but the beauty of it is we're, <laughs> not, uh, we are still working remotely, so in any way it doesn't affect what we do. Uh, so I'm still very positive. <coughs> Even people that are protesting, they are protesting for uh, a legitimate cause. They are they are protesting for something valid, uh, and it's for the good of everyone. So yeah, uh, I remain positive. Thank you. Please pass it on to someone else. Okay. Um, Just on the participant. Uh, okay. I, I saw, okay. Eric. All right. Eric, over to you. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes. So, as I, read, I rightly typed in there, I'm joining in from Ghana. And yeah, I've been also following most of the happenings, especially the NSAS in Nigeria. And we are hoping that at the end of the day, um, we'll have a positive um, outcome and then everything will go well for the continent as a whole. Thank you. Um, so How do you feel yourself in Ghana? Everything over there. Um, so <laughs> I'm just trying to find somebody. Okay, Monet, if Monet is around, uh, Monet kindly pick it up from me. Thank you. Hi, Eric. Uh, thanks very much for the nomination. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name is Monet Jure. Uh, I'm based in the uh, UK. 
I work for a company called Genesis Analytics. I'm really excited to be part of the workshop. Um, I'm quite interested to, to learn more about uh, using mobile uh, data collection. I think the, the challenge is, is, is especially about how we, we now select our samples. Um, how do we actually uh, engage with the participants when we collect data? Um, you know, we've, we've before had, you know, mobile data collection in terms of doing face-to-face -face using things like Happy. Um, but I think the challenge is now uh, where we all in this virtual world, I think is, is, is quite a new place to be. So really interested to hear more about people's experiences and to learn from each other. Um, maybe I can just preempt uh, us in the UK. We are unfortunately uh, in our second wave, it seems. <laughs> which is, is not great. Uh, maybe we can provide some lessons for, for people um, who are still in their first wave. Um, so um, yeah, I think the, the mood is a little bit down. Uh, I think we were hoping to, to miss the second wave, but as one enters winter, um, I think unfortunately things get worse. Um, so yes, that's me. Uh, let me see if I can find someone else. Um, Let's see. Uh, uh, Emily? Right, Emily, over to you. Okay. Uh, maybe who is feeling excited to share? We have two more slots. Okay, I'll give it a go since nobody wants to say anything. <laughs> so my name is Maria Glover. I lead the projects at the Impact Investors Foundation based here in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm particularly excited about what Andy is doing and um, this impact, invest, uh, impact measurement workshop, really, uh, I really want to have more information about impact measurement because if we are going to grow the impact investing space impact measurement is very important i would like to learn from everyone here about my mood i'm feeling very positive and excited that the youth in nigeria are finally waking up to their responsibilities and pushing the government to be more accountable in leading this country i see this as a beginning of a great revolution and I see more youth going to take on the affairs of leading this nation. So kudos to all the young people. And I'd like to see this happen across the world. Thank you very much, Andy, for this opportunity. Right, thanks, Maria. One more slot for someone to speak up. Okay, Joshua. Um, this is Leah from Growth Africa. Um, we actually have six offices in Africa, but I sit in the Accra office. Also excited to hear about impact measurement. We just finished with our first cohort, so we are very excited to see what the impact has been for us. And it would be good to understand how to collect the impact data and uh, analyze it. Yeah. So excited, anticipatory, yeah, and open to sharing those. Um, yeah, excited, um, high anticipation to what okay. we're going to learn. Yeah, and open right. to sharing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. And we, we, we're glad to hear how you're feeling. And of course, we are sending a virtual hug to everyone. Uh, we know everything is uh, for the good of each and every one of us. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, like you can see on my screen, uh, it's going to be exciting today uh, because we have uh, one of our sessions, which it has really been like a, a point of interest for quite a number of persons in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, the challenge used to be uh, thinking about maybe it's the cost of actually measuring impact or how to be about it. But one thing that we've realized over time uh, engaging with uh, various actors is not actually in the cost of uh, measuring impact, but of course in how to measure and knowing what uh, to measure. And of course, at this time, when things are looks like we have to work remotely, uh, it's really interesting to uh, look at in terms of uh, collecting impact data uh, remotely uh, using uh, mobile technology. And of course, 
uh, we found uh, one of our great partners, uh, which actually is actually going to be introducing herself. Uh, my time is up for me, but I'll quickly go through the uh, the instruction. Uh, yeah, so uh, for this session, feel free to use the uh, chat box to ask uh, your question. And uh, as much as possible, we also would like to limit the activities in the chat box so that we can see uh, the important questions in the chat box. And of course, uh, feel free to connect with other participants, uh, ask questions in the chat box, ask them for uh, about what they do. But like I said earlier, we should limit the, uh, the number of activities in the chat box. And please mute yourself when you are not speaking, except the participant actually would like uh, you to speak up. So at this point, uh, this is Ashley. Uh, I will give it to Ashley because of my time uh, to actually introduce herself, uh, her years of experience in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And of course, from there, we can uh, move into the session. Ashley, over to you. And thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really great to be here today and to uh, take a moment uh, out of this crazy world where things all over the place are, are happening to um, take a step back and talk about impact measurement and why we're doing the work that we're doing. So I am Ashley. I um, started my career in international development and social entrepreneurship uh, when I was 16, actually, and started a nonprofit uh, in Tanzania. And it was not long after that I actually read uh, The Blue Sweater by Jacqueline Novogratz, founder of um, and CEO of Acumen. Uh, so I read The Blue Sweater and felt that impact investing was uh, a better alternative to kind of my naive 16-year-old self going in and starting a nonprofit. Uh, and so that's actually how my journey uh, in this space began. And in 2014, I actually uh, started working for Acumen in New York and started working on the impact measurement team. And in 2016, I moved to Nairobi, uh, where I actually worked very closely with the um, Andy uh, East Africa chapter, the Nairobi chapter. And uh, I was working there to build and scale lean data, which was our approach to impact measurement at the time. And so after uh, a couple years in Nairobi, I moved um, to San Francisco, where I am right now. And I am working for 60 Decibels, which is the spin out actually of Acumen's impact measurement arm into a separate uh, for profit company. So today uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, you should all be able to see this. Um, full screen, great. Okay, uh, so yeah, also feel free to take down my email address and would be happy to answer any questions, obviously during the session, but also after. Uh, so it's just ashley at 60decibels.com. So for today's session, I will be giving an overview of, sort of the, the 60 decibel story. And as I mentioned, how we started within Acumen and then spun out uh, into 60 decibels. And then I'll give you an overview of the theory of change, which I think is a great tool to really articulate your impact goals and decide what to measure. I know it can feel overwhelming to start talking about impact measurement and where to begin. And so I think this is a really great tool to start somewhere. And then we will get into breakout groups and you'll have an opportunity to actually create a theory of change for a company that we worked with in Nigeria called Sultry International. Uh, and then we'll have a full group discussion and uh, I'm happy then to share some tips on remote data collection during COVID. Uh, so we've been collecting data um, during COVID and putting it into a dashboard um, all remotely. Uh, and so I can share some of the results from that. Um, so that's today's agenda. And so hopefully, I mean, we'll be going through uh, a background to impact measurement, but then we'll also, I hope what's clear is that 
mobile data collection kind of underpins our entire philosophy and our approach. So even though we're talking about theory of change for the bulk of this session, uh, I, I do think that that's a necessary step to then begin the mobile data collection. Uh, and so I'm hoping that today um, you'll leave this session with the underlying philosophy, a framework, and then tips to actually go out and collect data uh, remotely. Great. So before we get started, I wanted everyone in the chat to just share what words come to mind when you think about impact measurement. Okay, I'm seeing some that are starting to come in. I think the chat might be a little bit delayed, but evaluation, results, that's great, growth, causality versus correlation, great. And you can be open if there's, oh, decision making, numbers. Collecting metrics that prove people's lives are better. Progress tracking. Awesome. What I sometimes see when, when I ask this question, which I'm not seeing right now, which maybe means this is a very advanced audience, is um, complex, uh, cumbersome, difficult, confusing, but I'm not seeing any of that here. So <laughs> I don't know uh, if people are just being polite or or if um, no one thinks it is. But I'll be honest that I think when, you know, it, when I was starting out my work in impact measurement, I do think that the words that probably came to my mind way back then were confusing, not quite sure where to start, expensive. Um, and so what I hope to sort of debunk is how impact measurement doesn't need to necessarily be those things, um, but it actually really can be what is mentioned in this chat, right? So um, progress tracking, used for decision making, measuring what matters, who's been affected, sustainability, social and environmental effects, improvement. Okay, love it, that's great. Results from applied strategy, that's great effects that your actions have. Okay, awesome. So I want to start by just going back to why we're even talking about impact measurement. So the definition of impact investing um, is, I'll just read it from Sir Ronald Cohen here, it's impact investing means investing in companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial, social or environmental impact in addition to financial return. So let's unpack that. I want, what I want to highlight here is this aspect around measurable social or environmental impact. And so that's really what differentiates impact investing from just traditional investing, right? It's this piece here around having an actual measurable social return. And so within Acumen, which was an impact investing organization, um, the financial returns were pretty straightforward, right? We have a whole field of financial accounting and it's pretty easy to measure the financial piece of this um, right here, this definition. But when it comes to measurable social returns, obviously that's not as straightforward. And so at Acumen, what we did was for the beginning of, um, from 2001 to 2012, we, Acumen primarily relied on its investees or portfolio companies to supply social impact data. And what we found was that companies um, were either, you know, not interested in doing this, they didn't know how or where to start. And, um, what that resulted in was that we weren't actually able to understand what that measurable social return was. And so that's where we realized we had to get a little bit more creative as Acumen and as the impact team within Acumen. 
And so what we realized was that measurement that was done at the behest of the funder um, only was not yielding any valuable insights. And so uh, what you can see here is that if you start from this kind of top-down approach, which was around measurement to create value for the funder, um, so as you can see here, the investor, the fund, all the way down to the company and the customer, uh, that, that wasn't actually yielding any results. And so we tried to flip that narrative. And uh, I think this is so important to measure because this was the uh, fundamental premise that our approach to impact measurement was built upon. And so we wanted to move towards an approach that primarily adds value for companies and customers. And so as you can see here, we really tried to flip this uh, paradigm to focus on measurement that creates value for the company or the customer. And so when we started to think about measurement to create value for the social enterprise or the organization, you know, that's when we noticed a real interest and uptake in getting these measurable social returns. And so in 2014, we developed Lean Data, which is our approach to impact measurement that was based on listening to customers. And so our tagline is, we make it easy to listen to the people who matter most. And most of the data that we collect is through phone surveys, uh, sorry, phone surveys conducted by our network of over 650 researchers that are in a distributed. Oops, sorry about that. Um, that are distributed across uh, over 38 different um, countries. And so, yeah. In a nutshell, uh, what we do is we collect data through phone surveys, um, working with local researchers in various different countries, uh, using high quality questions and doing the analysis and synthesis in-house. And so, so far we have surveyed over 110,000 end customers or beneficiaries of social enterprises. We've worked with over 600 researchers. Um, there have been over 250 companies that have worked with us um, through Lean Data. Our average response rate is around 52%. 70% um, of the data that we collect is through phone surveys, so all mostly remote. The average survey length is around 15 minutes, so we try to keep the surveys short and to the point. Uh, and then most importantly, I think we, we try to act quickly. So we want this data to be used for decision making uh, and to actually inform um, strategy. So as we mentioned in the chat box, uh, I think impact measurement is only as useful as um, the decision making, you know, as the ability to make decisions from the data. And so I think we try to keep our projects pretty quickly and fast so that um, we can make decisions from it. And then uh, last year, we spun out of Acumen. And um, as I mentioned, we became 60 decibels. Uh, 60 decibels is actually the volume of human voice in conversation. Uh, and so we are now a separate entity from Acumen. Um, we work primarily with impact investors, foundations, social enterprises, uh, and there's about 50 full-time employees now, and we are distributed across various offices. We have offices in New York, London, Nairobi, and Bangalore. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the, the core indicators that we collect as 60 decibels. So when we're working with impact investors or companies, these are some of the metrics that we're helping them uh, collect and actually gather and learn from. So things around income profile, uh, quality of life improvements, challenges that beneficiaries or customers have experienced, uh, the net promoter score and customer effort score, which is really a measure of 
customer loyalty and satisfaction uh, and the service that they're receiving and access to alternatives. So um, how scarce essentially the, the product or service is that is being provided. Uh, and then whether this is the first time that someone is accessing these products or services. Great, so that was a quick um, <laughs> overview of 60 decibels and um, how we started and kind of that origin story. So I'll just pause there uh, and see if there's any questions just on our approach to impact measurement, the spin out from Acumen, or any questions about um, remote data collection before I move on to the theory of change framework. And if you have questions, I mean, feel free to share them in the chat or, or just go off mute and feel free to, to share. Great. Okay, so I'm going to answer this question um, from Philippa. Uh, how are these surveys delivered on the phone? Call center, SMS, or USSD? So we have built a, a network of researchers that are employed by us on a contract basis. And so we have now over 600 researchers in over 38 countries. And so whenever we start a new project in any country, uh, we work with our team of in-house researchers and they, um, they actually conduct the surveys um, through their cell phones and through um, software that we have. And they'll call the customers directly, uh, ask the questions and then input that data into our backend software. And so, it's essentially, you can think of it as a remote call center that we are managing. And um, we, we general, generally do use SMS to supplement that. So, you know, before our researchers call respondents, we'll have um, SMS text messages that are actually sent to the respondents to say, you know, please expect a call in the next week from a representative from 60 decibels, they're, you know, calling to better understand your experience with this company or this organization. Okay, uh, mind sharing a bit more on the concept of lean data. Sure. So, I mean, one of the, the principles that I focused on was this shift away from top-down compliance-oriented data collection and towards a more bottom-up approach that's focused on listening to customers. Uh, but I think another core concept behind lean data is around switching the paradigm from traditional monitoring and evaluation, which generally um, takes a long time, so maybe a year to three years to get results back sometimes, uh, can be quite expensive if you're doing a traditional, you know, randomized control trial. And so we wanted to provide an approach that, as I said, could be used for rapid decision making and could be done at a fraction of the cost of some of the more traditional methods. Uh, so that's a little bit more on the concept of lean data. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, and then how well do customers react to researchers' data and do questions have to be formulated in any particular way? Yeah, so I mean, I think researchers' questions. Oh, okay, got it. How well do customers react to researchers' questions and do questions have to be formulated in a particular way? So yeah, I mean, we put a ton of effort into how questions are phrased, um, both obviously in English, but then how they're translated into the various local languages. So 
Fun fact, I think our researchers combined speak more than 110 um, different languages. And so, I mean, a huge focus for us internally is exactly how the uh, questions are phrased, um, doing tests, uh, doing pilots with new questions always, and getting feedback actually from our researchers on how customers are reacting to the different questions, how well understood the questions are, or whether we might need to make small tweaks to make it more uh, understood. And so um, that is a key part, I think, of any data collection, but in particular mobile data collection where you know the time on the phone that you have with an individual is scarce and you want to make sure that it's also engaging for the respondent um, and that you're not keeping them on the phone for you know too long uh, and so i do think that that's uh, a very important consideration for remote data collection uh, and then the last thing i'll say on that is i think it is also very important to decide what metrics or what questions are essential and so sometimes we'll get surveys from our clients that are you know a hundred questions <laughs> And of course, you know, when you're writing the survey, it's so easy to, to think, oh yeah, I would like to know all of this from, from participants or from um, customers, but it's so key for mobile data collection to, to really distill what are the most important insights to gather and then think through beforehand how you might make decisions based on that data that you get. And if you're finding that it's hard to uh, actually synthesize the decisions that you would make based on the data that would come back, uh, we would say just scrap it from, from the survey. Um, and then one other quick um, uh, just piece of advice on survey questions and how to frame, phrase them. Um, so internally, we have what we call um, a phrase brain pain. And so uh, if a question, a survey question, causes a lot of brain pain, um, scrap it. So if it's something that, you know, when you're asking a respondent, they have to scratch their head and be like, I don't know how many eggs I ate in the last, you know, month, that is just not a good question and it's not going to make respondents um, happy. And so really do use that filter of like, how would I answer this question? Is this something that I could feasibly answer? And does this actually cause brain pain or is this something that is easy to answer? Okay, um, so I'm gonna move on, but I mean, please keep the questions coming because even if I don't answer them now, I can, um, I can always share more after the session. Um, and so we are going to get into this theory of change. And so I think the theory of change is a really practical framework to define your impact objectives and what to measure. Um, so it can really be overwhelming to think about impact measurement, all the different metrics, where do you begin? I think the most common question that we get is, you know, like, where do we even start? What metrics? How do we know what to measure? Uh, and so this is a really great tool for organizations, investors, companies to break this down. And so even as 60 decibels as a company, like we have our own theory of change. And so that's just the framing behind why I think this is so important as a first step in the impact measurement process. So let's start with the definitions. So a theory of change consists of inputs, outputs, and outcomes. And so the inputs are the products or the services that are provided. Uh, the outputs are the products or services that a user actually receives. And then the outcomes are the short or long-term effects on an end user's well-being. And so there's actually one more element to a theory of change that is not uh, included here. If anyone knows what it is, um, put it in the chat. <laughs> uh, but the most important aspect of a theory of change is um, 
assumptions. Oh, people are saying impact. Yes, that, that is actually, that's great. Um, so I didn't actually include impact here because I think outcomes can be, this is slightly simplified, but you can think about outcomes as more like short-term impact or results on end user well-being, and then impact as longer-term outcomes, or um, you can start to also think about um, kind of the counterfactual with impact, but this is a little bit more simplified, so we won't get into all of that right now. But what I was um, saying is assumptions. And so what is so important here is to consider what has to hold true to go from inputs to outputs to outcomes so that your actual input uh, impact that you want to deliver occurs. And so, for example, the assumptions between an input, so the product or service provided, and an output uh, is what actually needs to happen so people use the product or service. So is that marketing activities by the company or, you know, um, demand for the product or service? So basically, it's not just enough to make a whole bunch of solar home systems or lanterns, right? You obviously want to make sure that people are actually buying them. And so that's the first step in the theory of change. And then the second major assumption is what needs to happen for the product or service to actually be used effectively. So let's say someone buys a solar home system. Great, we've gone from input to output. But then to actually make sure that the, the outcomes are achieved or realized, people need to be using the product or service effectively. Uh, and so I will just walk through an example. So D-Light is a solar home system company. Um, I think, I believe they're actually active in, in West Africa as well as East Africa, but um, from my time in Kenya, I worked closely with them and they sell small um, solar home systems. Well, actually small solar home systems, but also larger systems. So I'm going to just share an example of the theory of change for a small solar lantern. So in this case, the input here would be the actual solar lantern that D-Light is manufacturing or would like to sell. And then the output is the number of households that have the solar light or that have bought this solar lantern. And so the assumptions that need to hold true here to go from an input to an output if people again want to insert into the chat that, feel free to do that. Um, I'll give you a moment if you want to do that. Uh, but basically here, remember, you need to think through what actually needs to happen from, you know, a solar lantern being manufactured or in a store or something to actually being in someone's house. So you need to have the right distribution and marketing to target to your target demographic. Um, customers need to see the lantern as affordable or as something that they want to buy. Lanterns, there needs to be some value proposition. So maybe they're more reliable, brighter, and more affordable than kerosene. So really the, the aspects here are around demand generating characteristics. Uh, and so I see someone in the chat has says, yeah, easily accessible. Exactly. So if someone doesn't know where to go to get this lantern or they have to travel a super far distance, then you're not actually going to reach that output. And so these are all very important for the company or the impact investor to consider when they are launching a product or um, thinking about how to actually make sure that they're designing and tailoring their products to be as impactful as and effective as possible. And so the next stage here is from output to outcome. And so, of course, there's a lot of different short and long-term outcomes, but again, I've simplified this and tried to just distill to a couple key outcomes. And so the output as we mentioned, is the number of households with solar light. And then the outcomes here are reduction. So again, an outcome is the result 
um, to an end user's well-being. And so maybe this is reduction in kerosene usage, uh, which hopefully leads to improvements in health, uh, and then perhaps increased study hours. And so the assumptions that would need to hold true to go from this output to this particular, these outcomes are that customers are using the lantern regularly. They know how to charge it and keep it clean. So if they're not using it, they bought it, but they're not using it, obviously the impact won't be achieved. Um, so we're also assuming that solar is a replacement for kerosene and that it's not just one other source of light, but people are using the same amount of kerosene. Um, and then I think a really interesting one is just around um, if we are listing increased study hours as an outcome, a big assumption that we're making is that these solar lanterns are actually used for educational purposes. So why, what I want to highlight here is this directly helps inform what the questions that you ask in your survey are. So perhaps maybe you ask them some questions around how the solar lantern is used. Maybe you ask questions around, you know, how often it's used, or you ask questions around whether they're still using kerosene. And so this provides a guide or a framework for you to start to understand what questions do I need to ask to start to understand what impact is actually being delivered or achieved? And so if we put it all together, then it's uh, this is the theory of change for D light. So again, the input would be that solar lantern. The output is number of households with solar light. And again, these are the assumptions that need to hold true to go from this stage to the second stage. And then the outcomes, obviously, as we just mentioned, reduction in kerosene use and increased study hours. And so I just wanna underscore that what is so helpful here about listing these assumptions in this way is that it can directly inform what metrics you use and what survey questions you actually include. So again, Maybe you ask questions around the value proposition of the solar lanterns. You ask questions around how easy it was to access the product or service. You ask questions around affordability uh, to better understand how you can actually increase uptake so that more people can buy this service. But then it's not just enough to have, you know, 100,000 plus people buying the product or service. You actually want to know, you know, once someone buys it, are they, um, what benefits are they experiencing and how do we uh, design the product or make um, small changes so that they're actually uh, experiencing the full benefit of the product or service. And so that's where the second half of the theory of change around value uh, and usage and um, changes in quality of life and really getting the customer or beneficiary's perspective on that is so important. So any questions around theory of change, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, but the next step now is to actually go into breakout groups and do this yourselves. Uh, for a company in Nigeria that I mentioned we worked with. Uh, the company is called um, Sultry International, so PIL. And um, PIL is a company in Nigeria that buys unprocessed cassava from smallholder farmers. And it provides farmers with access to markets, training, and inputs. And so I've included two links here. Uh, one is the website of the company, and then one is actually a case study that we did um, with, that we wrote about the company and about our work with them. So if you just type in um, bit.ly slash sultry, uh, you'll, you'll get uh, the case study. Um, but again, this is an agriculture company that 
is trying to provide access to markets to farmers and they're doing that by um, providing them with training, providing them with agricultural inputs uh, such as fertilizer, seeds, but actually also um, like things like tractors or mechanization. And they're then buying that cassava from um, farmers and selling that uh, elsewhere. And so we um, need, as this exercise, our job is to think about their theory of change. And so what are they providing as the input? What are those assumptions? What's the output and um, the outcome? And so I think as you're doing this exercise, oh great, thanks for putting that in the link. I'll just also share the company's website or confidence, feel free to do that. But um, so be thinking about what are the most important or surprising assumptions in the theory of change and how would you test that? So, I mean, if you're very advanced, you can even start like drafting survey questions and how you might distill maybe the top 10 questions that you'd want to ask through a remote survey. Um, but again, this, we just shared this in the chat. So we've shared the case study, the company's website, and then also this um, theory of change uh, screenshot. And so I'll leave this up on my screen and again, go in the chat, but we'll have 15 minutes in breakout groups to actually create the theory of change for this company. So confidence will break us out into different groups, um, but please write in the chat now if you have any questions. Um, and if not, we'll meet back here in about 15 minutes. Hi, Steven. Can you hear me? Maybe it's not as nice, um, with his phone. Okay. Can it be automatically assigned to your group? That when he gets back. Yeah. To you? I already assigned him to your group. Oh, okay. okay. Did you come back? Maybe you come back. Can you redo it? Maybe you didn't. Uh, Let me try it again. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of, yeah. All right. Do I have the ability to move from room to room to just to check what's happening? Yeah, yeah, you could host yes, you do. Okay. All right. Thanks, confident. Thanks so much, Ashley.
Confidence. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I assume there is instruction on what people will do in the different rooms, right? Yeah, that's that's what she was explaining. Okay. Do you want to, is this something you can type and put in the different chart so, so that they know what they need to do? Okay. Hi everyone, it's Ashley. Yeah, everyone has been assigned, except okay. you want to move from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. you have to join your, your room, okay. You can just Would it be your... helpful to, for me to just write what the exercise is in the chat? Yes, that would be helpful. Okay. Confidence, can you assign JC? Welcome, JC. Can you assign JC to, I think, group six or something? Like that? I moved him already. Okay. Uh, we don't have enough. You have just four people in group six. Let me see. Let me, let me go there. Joshua is there, though. Joshua is in group six. <laughs> Okay, do, and do you think it's clear to, to people what the exercise is? Uh, I think we can also move to the rooms and just check that. Okay. Yeah. Just check that. Yeah, confidence. Can you reassign people in group six? Joshua felt that they are too small. So you can just it's too small. Okay. Yeah. Check them and um. hi Solomon. Thanks for joining. Uh you'll be assigned to your group. There is a breakout group now. So you'll be assigned to a breakout room. Can you hear me, Solomon? You can just nod if you can unmute. Can you hear me, Solomon? Uh, confidence, do you mind putting me into another breakout group? Um, Ashley, I think you're a co-host, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So just click on the breakout room button. You see all the rooms and you can just click on anyone you want to join. Oh, okay. You've seen that? Yeah, I see you've been assigned to breakout room one. Yeah, um, uh, and I think you can also, you can just click on uh oh 
on any of the group, there is a there should be a join button on the line where you are maybe room three or room four. If you are a co-host, then um, I don't see that. Uh, let me see. Let me check whether you are co-host. Where did confidence go to? Uh, but can you see all the rooms? I mean, list of the rooms. Like mm -hmm. one, when you click on the breakout room button. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. see you've been assigned a breakout room one. Oh, uh, okay. I, maybe you're not a course. Let me get confidence to room. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm not sure if I have ability to assign you. Mm. Second, let me just get confident.
Hi, everyone. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes just for everyone to, to return and to finish. Okay, great. So I hope that was uh, an engaging, interesting exercise to start thinking about a theory of change for this company. Uh, I think, I mean, because there's so many of us on the line, there's 35 of us, we're not going to, you know, go through each different group. But just in the um, in the chat box, if you could just put out some of the um, the inputs that you put here for the products or services that Sultry International provides. So again, thinking about this company, so the cassava, the company that buys unprocessed cassava from smallholder farmers, providing them with access to markets, training, and inputs. So what is the product or the service that this company provides? Great. Okay. So I see research and training. Yes, that's certainly one thing that they're providing. Extension services. Yeah. Processing. Perfect. Okay. And then the outputs. So what are the products or the services that the end user receives? Great. So yeah, they might receive a loan. So I'm realizing that this is actually a, um, a PDF, so I can't edit it. Um, but so I'm just going to skip ahead actually to what I've, this is the draft that I, that I had started. So great. So the input here that I've um, put is access to markets, training, inputs such as seeds or fertilizer. The output uh, is the number of farmers that are selling to companies, uh, that are selling, sorry, to the company, the number of farmers that are accessing inputs, and the number that are accessing training. Okay, and then did anyone have another uh, short or long-term outcome here? So I had better and stable price, more regular payment, uh, increased volume purchased, increased revenue, reduced cost, and a stable and predictable income. Great, yeah, increased productivity. Yeah, that's great, I would add that here, oops. And then the assumptions, I'm, I don't think I actually did fill this in, um, but does anyone have any assumptions for between input and output that they want to share? Great. So accessibility of these services, yep. Right, so the farmers need to obviously know about this company. They need to um, actually have an interest in attending the trainings. If the inputs are free, uh, if they're not free, they have to be able to afford them or get a loan for them. 
Great. Yep. Ex assuming the farmer will be willing to sell to the company. Yep. After extension services. Exactly. Maybe they're selling to someone else. Motivation to buy the input. Exactly. So again, all of these things that you're mentioning in the chat box, I would ask, uh, this would be a key survey question to include in any survey with the farmers. So whether they sell to other buyers, um, how affordable these inputs are, things like that. And then assumptions from output to outcome. So I think the assumptions here, I mean, one is that the company is actually providing them with a more competitive price than they would have received elsewhere. Any other assumptions between this output to outcome? Yeah, that the training actually works, exactly. So that the training leads to more output or that the uh, inputs, the, the um, fertilizer, or the seeds, that that actually does lead to increased uh, output by the farmer. Great. Okay. So I hope what this did was just uh, provide a bit more of a framework around to help you think through what types of metrics or survey questions are important to include in any remote survey. And so this uh, is just a summary here, but what we did was we spoke to sultry international farmers, uh, our researchers in Nigeria conducted the surveys, and we found that um, farmers were reporting significant expenses and challenges with actually transporting their cassava to sell it. So again, this is a, an assumption, right, that once farmers are making the, are, are producing cassava, they can actually sell it. And so what they were finding was that they couldn't because it was too expensive to transport it, to sell it. Uh, and then again, even if they were selling it, they experienced delayed payments from the company. So PIL wasn't actually paying them on time. And so what the company did after they got these insights, which you know directly showed them that that optimal usage of the service wasn't actually happening, the company set up a new mini processing plant um, closer to farmers to help reduce transportation costs. And then they actually shared the lean data study results with a local bank to secure a letter of intent um, to help them get a new loan that will help them um, get a new loan to make farmer payments on time. And then what they also did was uh, the impact of this is helping to decrease farmers' costs and actually ensuring that the farmers do receive the benefits from, um, from this service. And the idea is that this debt financing um, will allow the company to have more cash to make farmer payments on time. So hopefully that gives a illustration of how important it is to write out this theory of change, use it to inform the questions that you might ask, and then uncover whether that optimal usage is happening or if it's not. And then if it's not, what actions might need to be taken to make sure that the actual impact or the outcomes that you're hoping to have will come to fruition. So before we move on just to this last part here, just around how we're collecting data during COVID uh, and open it up to a full discussion, are there any other questions just on theory of change or this, this uh, project that we did with this company in Nigeria?
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box, but if there's a delay, let me know. Great. So I wanted to briefly just touch on how 60 decibels is collecting data during COVID uh, remotely. And so obviously now is a time where most in-person research has come to a stop. And so what we're finding is that the work now of just remote data collection is more important than ever and more relevant than ever. And so what we started to do was when we were um, working with companies to help them hear from their customers during this time, we have started asking standardized questions across all projects about how people are coping or faring in the face of COVID. And so what we have is a COVID dashboard. I'm actually gonna click on this just so that um, I'll share my screen with you so that you can see what I mean. Hopefully you can see this dashboard. If not, please let me know. <laughs> um, but we have three different dashboards. One is um, a gig economy worker gash dashboard, one is an agriculture dashboard, and one is for financial inclusion. And so what this means is just basically who we've heard from and whether they're like financial inclusion customers or agriculture customers. And so what we have here, um, so far we've speaking to, spoken to over 23,000 individuals across 19 countries. And so what we're getting is um, time series data, but then also just data um, by region and by country. And so I'd encourage you to take a look here um, at, on your own time. You can uh, filter for um, location, for countries, uh, and you can see exactly what question was asked uh, through this remote survey, through all of our phone surveys, and then um, what these responses are. So it's kind of, it's taking a little bit of time to load, I think, because I'm sharing my screen, but I wanted to share that this is the work that we're doing right now to collect data um, during COVID. Uh, and what this is giving us is comparable data across different countries around how vulnerable individuals are. So we've created a vulnerability index, which combines a lot of different metrics into one um, particular score. And so we can start to see here, um, you know, how individuals are faring in different countries. And we can start to compare that to like government regulations and um, start to pull out insights around, you know, what what's happening and I, I think this insight here actually around Tanzania is very interesting because um, that's the country where um, the vulnerability score is actually the the lowest and so that means that people in Tanzania generally are um, are less vulnerable than in other countries and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the um, economic uh, regulations haven't been as stringent there and so it's just an interesting comparison. And again, we've asked um, respondents around, you know, the decrease in food consumption. And so what I wanted to show here is just um, the percentage of respondents that have reported a decrease in food consumption um, in the various countries. And lastly, this is a snapshot of some of the quotes. And uh, I think what's so important during remote data collection is getting not just the quantitative data like you see here, but also the qualitative data. And so I'll just pause here, but um, if you just look and read through these, maybe I'll read the second one here. Income has reduced because of, the not, because of not only the virus, but also drought. We can't grow rice, so we have reduced food, clothes, and health costs. And then someone in Nigeria, everyone is at home just eating. <laughs> the food we eat now increased three times while the income reduced very much. And so what I wanted to highlight here is just how important it is to hear from customers directly and 
actually get uh, this qualitative data, which we then code and analyze. Um, but again, I think reading through um, reading through these responses is um, is very important. And so lastly, just before we close, I wanted to, I'm going to send an email after this just with a couple different links, but the, if you haven't seen it already, the remote survey toolkit that we put together um, has tips and tricks for remote data collection during COVID. And so there's 10 tips for remote phone surveys. And a lot of this is actually things that I've just gone over, but around you know making sure that the survey is is short that it's appropriate for a remote setting understanding the goals for your survey so kind of putting together that theory of change uh, i won't go through all of them now but a lot of it is um just a summary of what i've shared today and then these are some resources for you so a cheat sheet to choose the remote survey um, technology to use so deciding whether you want to use SMS phone or another method. And then similarly, the pros and cons of different methods of remote surveys. Uh, different remote survey providers. So these are just companies that we've worked with or that we've um, have partnerships with that are doing remote surveys. And then rules of thumb for researchers that are conducting the work. So here's this enumerator checklist. Uh, and then finally, we've included some question sets. So these are a couple of questions that we've designed uh, that will help you understand, for example, value proposition and different themes. And so again, these are just kind of in modular format designed to, um, yeah, to help you understand what questions to ask and how to do that over remote surveys. So I will send the link to this remote survey toolkit in the follow-up email, uh, along with a couple other resources that I recommend. Um, but again, here's my email address and uh, we have 10 minutes left and so I will, just stay on um, for any questions and for a broader discussion, uh, but wanted to just thank everyone for joining today and taking the time out of your day to talk about impact measurement and listening. Uh, and wanted to thank Andy for organizing this. Um, really appreciate you creating the space um, to have these conversations. Uh, I've loved working with Andy over the past couple of years um, and really excited to have the chance to do this um, remotely. Thank you, uh, Ashley. Uh, I think you have some questions in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so are there templates for inputting responses from the survey? Great. So, Let me just read the questions first and then I'll, I'll answer them. Okay, so I'll start with uh, are there templates for what books? Ooh, okay, this is good. Questions are coming in. <laughs> All right, so the I'll start with templates for inputting responses and how the data is collated and analyzed. So, and our calls reported. Um, so we use Qualtrics to input the responses from the survey. So that's a tool, but there's tons and tons of different tools like that. So there's SurveyMonkey, you can even use Google Sheets, but in that remote survey toolkit, there's a list of remote survey providers and a lot of them provide that infrastructure to, um, to actually input the data. And then the 
everything is collated and analyzed in you can um, export it to an Excel format, and then we do analysis either in Excel or Stats IQ, which is something that's available through Qualtrics. Um, but again, if, if budget is an issue, definitely Excel is totally fine. Um, calls are not recorded. All of our calls are not being recorded at the moment. Um, some of them are, and so we're, we're just in the process of figuring out the, pro the strategy for call recording and whether we move towards having all calls recorded or just a, just a subset. Uh, and then just related to analysis, uh, the qualitative data, we, uh, we do all the qual coding ourselves, actually. So we have now built standard codes or categories um, and we will have our team actually go through and code each individual qualitative response so that we still get the same level of meaning and insight um, from from the data uh, okay so ideal way to present qualitative data I mean, so there's several ways you can do word clouds. Um, you can just put the quotes, but what we're doing is at actually putting the, um, well, I guess I can show you. Well, no, there's no example here of qualitative data, but um, you can also just show a chart with the, the categories. Um, but take a look at our dashboard at how we're visualizing qualitative data, I think it's a great question uh, because, again, it's that combination of the qualitative and quantitative data that's so important. Um, and then could you clarify if 60, 60 decibels is a standard for measuring impact or if it is only a tool for remote data collection? So, I mean, I would actually, I would say it's both. I think that we offer an approach to impact measurement and data collection. Um, so companies and uh, foundations or uh, impact investors can contract us and we will um, actually do the, the data collection or impact measurement on behalf of the project that you're working with or the company. Um, but also, I mean, what we're trying to move towards is when we have all this data moving towards benchmarks where we can actually say, um, which companies are outperforming our benchmark and we can actually provide some of that com comparative data to help set the standard for what um, what impact in different industries and sectors looks like. Okay. Um, major challenges that we face in gathering data remotely. I mean, again, I think that the challenges are, are so contextual. I think that in certain countries that we face challenges with response rates. Uh, and so, but in other countries, we um, like, you know, we do find differences in response rates ac across different countries. And so that's one challenge. Um, but again, I think there's various ways to, to mitigate that challenge. Uh, one thing that I mentioned is really being more proactive in terms of telling respondents, giving them a heads up about the survey and when that is taking place. Uh, I think that, um, I would say that, yeah, I mean, I'll just pause there and um, keep the major challenge to response rates. USSD for surveys, we um, we do not. Sometimes we will use that tool to, again, like alert um, respondents of the survey, uh, but we will not, that's not a primary tool for surveys. Uh, and then last question uh, I'll take, just because I know we're short on time, we have one more minute. Um, how do you ensure quality control of your data collectors, researchers? Yeah, I mean, great question. This is essential for us. This is incredibly top of mind. <laughs> we, um, there's various measures that we take to ensure quality. Uh, I can, I'll share two. Uh, so one is 
each um, day we actually conduct quality assurance. And so we'll do what we call quality checks where we will look at all of the um, data that has come back. We'll look at from across different researchers and we'll look across the data set in terms of one respondent and check you know, whether one answer is um, kind of contradicting another answer or whether you know, a row essentially aligns. Um, but then we'll also look for discrepancies and differences. So we'll look um, at, you know, one respondent, if their answers are significantly different from others or like tell a completely different story, um, that's something that, that we'll flag and we'll look into further. So one is daily quality checks. Um, and then we'll also do callbacks. And so we'll have other researchers actually call the respondent back and just say, hey, uh, you know, we just wanted to check that you received a call on this time or this date uh, and that you had, you know, a positive experience. Uh, so those are just two measures um, that we take to ensure quality of our, our data. And training is a huge part of um, how we work with our researchers. And so they all go through a six hour training before they start working with us. Um, but then we also offer ongoing training and we have a really engaged community of, um, of researchers that are working with us and that are highly um, motivated and, and really bought into the mission. So I'm very proud of our researcher team. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you for, for that question. Perfect. Well, we are at time. So Joshua, I'll hand it over to you, but wanted to thank everyone again for such an engaging um, conversation, for the great questions, and um, for showing up today. So thank you and looking forward to being in touch. Thank you, uh, Ashley. This has uh, it's been a very interesting session personally for me, and I believe it's the same for every other person. Uh, like, like Ashley mentioned, when, when she started, like, uh, it's always like this when you're having an impact measurement session because it's uh, because of the technicalities and all the things we need to go through, which is why we often uh, do this uh, as often as we can. We had a session also in January and this other session. And I believe if we have the time to bring Ashley again uh, to maybe take us through uh, developing some of the questions and a couple of other things, she will gladly uh, come to actually do this. So again, we like to say thank you so much, Ashley, for uh, offering to lead this, uh, this session. So uh, thank you everyone again. Uh, this is the uh, series of workshop we have been uh, supported by uh, Aspire Coordination Foundation, Trust Foundation, Act Foundation in Lagos, Nigeria. And of course, we have several other sessions coming up uh, before the end of the year, and of course, in the post quarter next year. So look out for email from uh, my colleague Confidence about the next uh, session. And the video, and uh, maybe the uh, PowerPoint also, I don't know. I will be shared with everyone who participated in this session. And of course, uh, if you have any question, please reach out. We can actually send to Ashley or every other facilitator to answer your questions. And with that, you even have the, you also have Ashley's email, so you can reach out to her directly. Again, we want to say thank you everyone for participating in this session, and we look forward to uh, meeting you again in the next uh, session. Have a good evening, everyone. And if it's still morning for you, have a good morning. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Ashley. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. everyone. Goodbye, Nadine. Goodbye, Sarah. I've just shared some links in the chat, so <laughs> feel free to check those out as well. Sure. Thanks, Ashley. We'll forward all the